All right, hello and welcome to AXI's Diesel 101. Today we're gonna to look at diesel fuel maintenance for mission critical applications. We'll run through a number of uh, configurations, uh, issues with diesel, and how to solve those kind of problems. So let's, uh, let's get started. Now, about AXI International, we are a A-plus rated business with the Better Business Bureau. We custom manufacture, pre-configure, uh, and create solutions within the diesel fuel industry for a number of applications, all related to backup fuel storage and the degradation of diesel fuel. Uh, as an overview for this presentation, we're going to touch on a few different subjects. One will be the nature of diesel fuel, then we'll move into the effects of contamination on diesel fuel, uh, moving into systems or technology you'll find using diesel fuel such as the high pressure common rail injection system, uh, that's big nowadays. We'll look at diesel fuel standards, emissions and tier ratings, the filters you use on your engine and what you can use for filters in terms of uh, remediating your fuel and keeping it maintained. Uh, we'll also look at diesel fuel as a reliability component uh, instead of just a commodity. We'll touch on that. Uh, then we'll look at necessary procedures to keep optimal fuel quality because that is very important. We'll look at the contaminants you can find within fuel. And then we'll look at a few system and integration options uh, for mission critical fuel facilities. So diesel engines, the reputation for diesel engines has always been that diesel is dirty, it's loud, it's noisy. Um, you'll see this going back a long time. Here in the US, that's probably a reason why everyone has moved more towards petrol or gasoline type engines. Uh, so the misnomer is really that diesel engines haven't improved over time, that they're still these bulky, noisy engines. Uh, nowadays, the technology has made them much more efficient, much more clean. You actually get more efficiency out of a diesel engine than you do out of a gasoline engine. So it's really important to understand where the technology has gone and where it used to be. So a diesel engine works um, through a four-stage process. It starts with induction. We pull air into the cylinder. cylinder. We compress that air as the piston moves upward. Uh, you ignite as you spray in fuel. You're combusting the fuel uh, with the hot air at high temperatures and high pressures. And then you exhaust the rest of that burnt um, air and hydrocarbons. Uh, the goal is to burn everything within the combustion chamber so that whatever is leaving your exhaust is basically water, uh, CO2, maybe a little bit of particulate, but stuff that we can take care of on the back end. Now a diesel engine will have much more torque and power than a gasoline engine, and that's why you see them used in larger uh, farm equipment, on-road trucking, different large machines. The reason for that is with a gasoline engine you have a spark plug. Now you compress the hot air just like a diesel engine, but what happens is at the top you ignite a spark and you know the combustion starts from that point. Now that combustion uh, begins at the point of spark and moves and propagates out throughout the combustion chamber, putting a force on the piston. Now that force on the piston in a gasoline engine hits the piston and pushes it forward. But you know that that combustion has been completed uh, within a certain amount of time. With a diesel engine, you are compressing the air with the fuel, but it's combusting because of the heat and the pressure. There is no spark or ignition point. So that explosion happens everywhere within the side of the combustion chamber at once. So it's propagating out and it's keeping a more constant force on the piston throughout its entire travel. What that does is that means you get more force on your camshaft, more force to your wheels, which gives you higher torque in that vehicle. Now, the important point is to note that diesel engines have improved so much that nowadays they can inject up to five times during one piston stroke. So not only are you combusting at one point once, you're combusting the entire piston travel. Now that's gonna make your torque curve and your power curve even higher, giving you more power. So that brings us into the contamination you're gonna find within diesel fuel. Um, it has been less important in the past to keep the fuel clean because the engines were less, uh, I guess, the, tight, or the tolerances weren't as tight. So nowadays, as the engine moves and the technology progresses, the engines get better, but the fuel basically stays the same or changes in small respects um, due to EPA mandates, due to uh, environmental concerns. The fuel changes a little bit, but the engine has changed a lot. Uh, so big contamination problems with water. Water is basically your worst constituent you can get in your fuel. What happens is water will progress its way to the bottom of the tank. It's more dense than the diesel fuel. So you're gonna have a layer of water on the bottom. Uh, that water is gonna sit, the fuel will sit on top of it. And in between those two layers, you'll get microbes, microbes and fungi. Uh, the misnomer is that algae is in your fuel. That's not typically correct. You need sunlight uh, for algae to photosynthesize its fuel. So you have a microbial growth with a fungi and it's eating the fuel but living in the water. It needs both. It needs that interface between the two. Uh, the byproduct of microbial growth and fungi is an acidic byproduct. So now you've got an aqueous solution in the bottom of your tank. 
you've got an acidic byproduct, and if you have a steel tank, a metal tank, you're going to begin to deg degrade that tank. And then you've got other problems with rust and other things entering your fuel system. Um, so that sludge is basically part of that inorganic, broken down fuel that the microbes are feeding on. Um, so when you see sludge or asphalt looking stuff in the bottom of your tank, that's normally what you're seeing. Asphaltines, now these are very large um, hydrocarbon particles that come from a bottle, barrel of crude. They're in the natural crude, but when they distill it and they change it to make the hydrocarbon fuels we use in everyday uh, applications, they're removing the majority of these. You may see some of these through the transportation process as fuel moves from um, refinery through distribution points to your, your tank. But normally not a big problem in the US. You'll see it more in third world countries. Uh, waxes. Waxes aren't a problem for your engine. Waxes melt. That's like what you see in a candle. The wax is going to melt on its own. Uh, waxes are a problem for your filter. They're very long hydrocarbon molecules and they stick together and what they do is they'll plug your filter up. So bad for your filter, not bad for your engine. No problem there. And then there's of course particulates and dirt. If someone maintaining a tank doesn't keep good practices, if they're not keeping all their valves tight or they let things degrade or erode on the system, natural Naturally, dust and air will enter your tank, um, bringing with it particulates and dirt. And when we talk about the size of the particulate and dirt, um, it's going to float in the air. It's very small, smaller than you can see with your eye. So keep that in mind. Now, like I mentioned, diesel fuel and water, um, you don't want to get them together as much as possible. This is going to be your worst thing. and It's going to lead to additional problems. Within your tank, you're going to find water in basically three different states. Um, free water being the most common. You'll see free water build up at the bottom of the tank. Like I mentioned, you'll get water that enters through uh, humidity, through rain if you don't have tight valves, and it's going to build up on the bottom of your tank as two separate layers. Now this layer here is where you're going to get your microbial and your fungal growth, and that's the layer you want to eliminate. So keeping water out of your tank is very important for that reason. Now from an economical standpoint, removing water from a tank is much easier when it's in a free water state to slowly sip it off the bottom of the tank than it is to mix it all up and turn it into a milkshake and then try to remove the water. Uh, the milkshake is an emulsified water state. Now what that is, is basically you've mixed water and diesel, you've sent it through a gear pump or you've sent it through a, uh, you've basically agitated that fuel and water enough where large fuel droplets uh, stay basically kept up in the fuel. They stay, um, they stay in the fuel for an amount of period, but they will fall back out eventually. It's just, if you're emulsifying fuel and you're sending it through your engine, that's bad. Fuel systems don't like water. You're gonna be corrosive. You're gonna have problems with your injectors. It's, it's not good. Um, so much more economical to remove free water than it is to remove emulsified water. This will take media. Now all diesel will naturally hold um, entrained or dissolved water within it. Now this is molecular H2O. So now you have particles that are floating in the diesel solution. Now those will naturally occur. All diesel has, um, it's a little bit hydroscopic, so it's gonna hold some water in it. Now this is where engine OEMs start to look at um, the requirements on what the engine can maintain for water through its injectors. Normally they base it on the dissolved water. They say a certain amount of dissolved water can make it through your injectors into your fuel system, but you should never have emulsified water. So this is where you get numbers like 200 ppm or 0.05% water um, maximum through your injector. Now the amount of water that diesel can hold is dependent upon the temperature. So as the temperature goes up, the fuel is going to be able to hold, naturally hold more water. So um, areas that are very high humidity uh, are going to hold more water. It's very high temperature. You're going to have more water in your fuel. Now there are methods for cooling the fuel to remove the water or bringing it back down into a free water state. but Economically, it's not uh, justifiable. You're gonna spend a lot of money trying to cool the fuel in order to get it down to that temperature. So usually it's not, uh, not done in practice or in the real world. Uh, just a note, biodiesel is more hydroscopic than regular diesel or ULSD. Biodiesel is gonna hold eight to nine times more water. So even in blends, you're gonna be holding more water within your diesel in an entrained state uh, if you have a biodiesel blend, especially with B100. Now this slide here, I just want to present a reference for you when we start talking about things like micron size and, and microbes and particulate. Um, it's good to kind of get an idea where we stand from our macroscopic perspective. Um, this large circle you see here, this is a 50 micron diameter and that's basically representative of the diameter of a human hair. So you can see your hair, it's clear to you. Um, 
it's not very clear, but some people have trouble. Uh, down here, you can see a micron size of 25, and that's a white blood cell. So we're getting pretty small here. No one really ever sees white blood cells. Uh, down here, you see a red blood cell. That's even smaller. And then we get down to a two micron diameter. Um, this is a bacteria, but this is the type of size for particulate that we're trying to remove from the fuel. And these will actually, in this range, up to four or five microns, will actually damage your injection system. So uh, what we like to say is it's much easier to determine you have a bad sample of fuel by looking at a dark colored fuel than it is to look at a clear sample of fuel and say this fuel is clean. So we always look at um, naming something as bad more than we would as something is good. Uh, here's just an example of what a diesel molecular structure is. Diesel is a hydrocarbon, like all fuels that we get from the crude process. Uh, basically, it's a number of carbon atoms, the black here, um, saturated with hydro or hydrogen molecules or hydrogen elements on the outside. Now, they'll take different shapes. This is a straight chain one, we call it. Um, but you can see this is 0 0.001 micron. So when we look at particulate agglomeration, or if your fuel is polar and it's sticking together and agglomerating and making a sludge in the bottom of your tank, we're not talking about a couple of molecules. You're talking about thousands of molecules in order to reach the size that you're gonna filter out of your fuel. So it's good to kind of understand. And here's just a, a molecule, or a carbon atom, sorry, 0 0.0007 micron. So the scale of things, this, may, this looks very large compared to the size of the fuel chemistry, but this looks very small compared to our macroscopic view. So it's important to understand what we're talking about. Now, diesel fuel comes, like I mentioned, from crude. You'll have different uh, types of crude. You'll hear sweet crude, you'll hear dirty crude, depending on where that source was taken from. Now, it all has to do with basically the number of hydrocarbons uh, as an average in there, what molecules you're getting, the shape that most of the hydrocarbon molecules take. Uh, really depends on a lot of factors, how that crude or how that um, fuel is actually made. To get the different dist uh, distillates or fractions out of a barrel of crude, the process is, is they heat at the bottom of a distillation chamber a large boiler and they put the crude through the boiler. Now, lighter or shorter chain hydrocarbons, if they have less carbon atoms, um, they're lighter constituents. So what happens is they move up or they start to boil. So lighter elements boil at lower temperatures. So if you're heating from the bottom of a source and you have a whole barrel of crude, uh, anything that's light out of that crude is going to make its way to the top of the distillation chamber. So what happens is in a distillation chamber at the top you have your methanes, your ethanes, your very low carbon numbers, two, three, and they, they make their way up and they boil. Now at some point up this distillation chamber um, you reach a lower temperature or low enough where these uh, constituents or hydrocarbons condense and they go back into the liquid form. Now in a distillation chamber they'll have shelves uh, at different levels. And what happens is as the fuel boils off and it vaporizes up the distillation chamber, it condenses when it reaches a low enough temperature and you get these shelves where they can take um, hydrocarbon cuts of fuel. So that would be your straight run diesel, kerosene, naphtha, gasoline. They remove these hydrocarbon components from these shelves and now you have a, um, a fuel that's ready for use. Uh, it will go through other processes depending on what the crude looks like. They'll cut it and they'll try to make different constituents. Um, they might want more gasoline because the demand is higher in the US. But uh, that is basically the way that they separate these constituents. Uh, it's done by boiling rate. So diesel fuel is a boiling rate, I believe, between 350 and 700 degrees Celsius. That's what defines diesel fuel. Now, these layers between, say, diesel fuel or kerosene or jet fuel, they're not, um, they're not rigid. They overlap. So diesel fuel is going to have some of the same molecules that jet fuel does and vice versa. So that's the process basically where they extract them. They do some additional processes, but you can see that diesel fuel itself is made up of carbon numbers or hydrocarbons with numbers from nine to 23 carbon atoms. Uh, this is kind of a histogram showing you the most common. So the most common you're gonna see here is C16 or 16 carbon numbers. So this is the curve that they designed the engine around basically. There's a certain profile that makes up diesel fuel and the engine is supposed to use that profile to um, to combust correctly. And then you can see, even though there's a variety of different hydrocarbon numbers or carbon numbers within hydrocarbons, they all have different shapes as well too. So you'll get paraffins, which are straight chains. Those could be waxes, that's very common. You've got isoparaffins, ones with legs and tails, and you've got cyclic compounds. So these actually change the chemistry as much as these. So diesel fuel is in a homogeneous fuel like water. It's not all the same molecule. You've got a variety of different shapes, a variety of different sizes. It's, it's a very complex fluid.
Classifications for diesel fuel. Depending on the country, you're going to have different classifications for what uh, the diesel fuel is um, chemically. Now, like I discussed with the distillation chamber, uh, there's overlap between different products you get from the distillation chamber. And there's also different products within each segment. So if you look at the diesel fuel cut that boils between, we'll say, 350 and 700 degrees C, there's going to be specific cuts within that. The top lighter elements is going to be like your 1D or your very light, uh, smaller hydrocarbons. Now you'll have 2D, which as you see at the general um, in the pump, that's your normal fuel you'd fill up your, your truck with. That's, that's somewhere in the middle of the diesel um, constituent. The 4D is gonna be your heavy distillate or home heating fuel oil, the stuff that's on the bottom. And then from the distillation chamber itself, the stuff right at the very bottom is your, your HFO, your heavy fuel oil, the stuff that some people use, uh, the large marine ships once they get offshore. Uh, not for use in engines like this though. Now, everyone understands or everyone has heard of cetane within your fuel. Everyone thinks it has to do with uh, horsepower. They'd like more cetane. That's kind of the goal that everyone thinks. Uh, it's not really true. It's kind of a misunderstood term. Cetane and octane are basically uh, polar opposites. With cetane, you want to advance the ignition. You don't want combustion happening in your tailpipe. So cetane is an indication of how quick all that fuel will start burning and get burning. Um, it has to do with... Um, Basically the hydrocarbons you have in there, uh, that histogram we showed, basically showing the constituents, that's gonna be uh, a factor in what your cetane level is gonna be. You want it to burn like the engine was designed for. So if it's not burning correctly or if it's not burning fast enough during that ignition point, uh, you're gonna have hydrocarbons that are burning in your exhaust. You're gonna get high exhaust gas temperature and you're gonna see maybe the headers turn orange. Uh, that's an indication that you don't have high enough cetane. Uh, that's why cetane is really big in cold weather starts. You want it to be able to start at the minimum temperature and pressure so that it doesn't uh, burn late. Or you'll get a knocking, basically. You're going to have combustion happening in your exhaust headers. You're going to hear a knocking. It doesn't sound like it normally would. Uh, that's a good indication. You need higher cetane fuel. Volatility and flash point. These are terms that we use more in the handling of fuel um, for safekeeping. They don't always have to do with how we, um, how we use the fuel. So all substances typically go through three phase, uh, a solid, a liquid, and a vapor, a plasma, if you want to count that. Now what happens is as the temperature goes up, solids turn to liquid, which turn to vapor or vaporize. Uh, and the same as you remove energy, vapors will condensate into a liquid and they'll freeze into a solid. Um, it's true for most liquids at least. So it's whether you're putting energy into the system or you're removing energy from the system. Now flash point is basically the the point at which one of those fuels will combust um, in a vapor form in a certain setting. Now, diesel fuel and gasoline are considered two different classes of fuels. Uh, diesel is heavier compounds or heavier molecules. So what happens is diesel at normal atmospheric pressure and temperature does not vaporize into the air. That means it's less volatile or it has a higher flash point. Gasoline, on the other hand, if you look at a gasoline tank on any day, any time, you can see a vapor, almost looks like a hot road with the sun. That is basically smaller, uh, short chain hydrocarbons from gasoline evaporating into the air. That makes it a very volatile fluid because if you were to combust that or put a match or an open flame near that, you will get a spark and a combustion. The, uh, the thing with diesel is you could, I wouldn't recommend this, but throw a match onto diesel fuel and your match is gonna go out because it's not vaporizing. Fuel lubricity, this became very important, uh, especially when we went to ULST or ultra low sulfur diesel. They removed the sulfur, which is normally found in the larger hydrocarbon molecules. Uh, by removing the sulfur and removing those large molecules, they pulled a lot of the factors or a lot of the components that made up the lubricity in the fuel. So there was an overall drop in lubricity. Now, most refineries are gonna put an additive package in after they leave the refinery so that it will bring it back up to the specs necessary uh, for the lubricity of the fuel, but um, the fuel itself, the natural chemical fuel is actually less um, of a, a lubricator than it used to be. Uh, the thing they use to measure this is the ASTM D975, and it's an HFRR test. You'll see this if you ever get a fuel sample and you want a lab report done. It's gonna be more expensive to get this test. It's a high frequency reciprocating rig. Now, what they're doing there is they're taking a metal plate with a steel sphere and they're vibrating the sphere over the metal plate with the fuel acting as a lubricant between the two surfaces. 
when they get done, they do it for 50 minutes or so at 70 hertz, and they look at the score depth, how deep that ball scored that surface. And that gives you an indication of how well that fuel acts as a lubricant. Now, 520 microns uh, under ASTM D975 is the maximum depth. Any deeper than that, and your fuel isn't providing enough lubricant for the injector, for the high-pressure pump, for the components in your engine that need that, that fuel as a lubricant. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, paraffin waxes or long chain hydrocarbons, um, they're the longest, they're carbon 23, 22, very long and straight. Now what happens in cold weather is the molecules aren't moving around very much. So what happens is the very long ones that don't have tails or chains or cyclic uh, characteristics, they kind of stick together. So they can't slide past each other very well. Um, there's intermolecular forces, I don't need to get into that, but basically they stick together and they drop out of solution. So once they're once they're, I guess, affixed to each other, they fall out and they move to the bottom because they're heavier components and you end up with something like this. Uh, if you ever look at your fuel and you know it's not water and you see a haziness at the bottom of the fuel and it's very cold, typically it's paraffin waxes. Like I said, waxes melt, so once they make it to your injector, it's not a very large problem. It's only a problem if it's clogging your fuel filter. If they start to um, drop out of solution and they clog up your filter, well now you obviously can't flow, but if they make it to your injector, you're fine. So, they still will combust, um, waxes burn. You should see that from a candle. That's what's actually burning, not the wick. <laughs> um, but the two terms we look at when we look at fuel in cold weather are the pour point and the cloud point. The pour point is more of a qualitative uh, term. If you're looking at your fuel and you go to pour it and it looks more like molasses than it does a liquid, uh, that is considered the pour point. It's not normally used as a measure, a quantitative measure, no one's consistently checking the pour point. What they will check is the cloud point. Uh, you can look at the fuel and if you start to see the wax is precipitating out and you see that white haziness, that's what's considered the cloud point. Carbon residue. Uh, like I mentioned, if you don't have a high enough cetane or your engine is running inefficiently, what's going to happen is you're not going to combust entire fuel molecules. So if you have a 23 carbon molecule and you combust half of it, the rest of that molecule is looking for something to affix itself to. It hasn't been completely saturated with oxygen. It hasn't oxidized completely. Um, it might stick to the interior wall of your engine, your exhaust, and you're going to get a buildup of carbon residue. Um, there are ways to break down this carbon residue, but burning efficiently is one way to prevent it. So if you can burn all that in the engine before it gets to your exhaust, before it gets out of your combustion chamber, that is obviously the, the most important thing. Because anything that you see stuck to your sidewall is fuel that didn't get combusted, which means you're running less efficiently using less of your fuel. Okay, now acidity in your tank. Acidity is a byproduct of having microbial growth or uh, fungi in there. It's breaking the fuel down. It's making an acidic byproduct. It's going into an aqueous solution if you have water on the bottle. So these two factors basically will attribute to these kind of a wear, um, wear and tear and corrosion. The corrosion is even worse problem than the microbes and the fungi and their byproduct. Those will clog up your filters and they're not great for your engine, but Hard uh, ferrous material or any kind of metallic substance going through your injector is much more damaging to your fuel system than the microbes and the, uh, the fungi. So preventing this is very, basically the most important concern and that's going to be again removing the water, making sure that water does not get into your tank. Uh, thermal stability. This topic I like to take from two different perspectives, one being the thermal stability of the fuel system as a whole and two being the thermal stability of the fuel. Uh, from a fuel system perspective, what happens during the day is warm, humid air enters your tank. Every time you pull fuel, the fuel needs to be uh, displaced by air within your tank. Diesel fuels are atmospheric vented, so anytime you pull fuel out, you're pulling in warm, humid air, unless you have some type of a breather. Uh, that warm, humid air will sit in there during the day, and at night it's going to condense as the temperature drops, and you're going to get droplets of water that build up on the interior tank surfaces. Now those droplets are going to get big enough where they're going to start to fall through the fuel, they coalesce together, they get large, they enter the fuel and they sink to the bottom of the tank. And that's where you get your free water in the bottom of your tank. So preventing uh, humidity, any kind of water inclusion into your tank is very important, whether it's through a breather and the humidity in the atmosphere, or whether it's through um, making sure all your seals are tight, that no water is getting in through your fuel supply. Uh, there's a number of ways you can prevent it, but thermal stability of the fuel system, you wanna make sure that humidity can't do any damage. Uh, from the fuel perspective, uh, we look at fuel that combusts within the combustion chamber. At a certain temperature and pressure, that fuel is oxidizing with the air in that system. Now, the same thing can happen in your tank over time. 
if you're raising the temperature of your, your fuel, the entire bulk tank, it makes it easier for that fuel to oxidize with the environment. Uh, oxygen is moving around in the air all around us. What happens is it's going to diffuse its way through the fuel and now you have locations where you could be oxidizing that or basically doing the combustion process but on a very small scale, molecular scale. And what you're doing is you're breaking down the fuel. Uh, that fuel doesn't have as much power as it used to have. You've already partially combusted it so now you're losing that efficiency. Also, once you start to oxidize some of these, um, you're making polar molecules and all you really need to know about that is polar molecules will stick together. So that's where agglomeration comes from. So preventing that is very important. Um, understanding that heating your fuel is bad. Uh, so if your, your engine is pulling a certain amount of fuel and returning half of it back to the tank, the engines will typically use half of the fuel for lubricity and cooling of the fuel system. That fuel is returned typically to the tank. So if you have a very small tank and you're returning fuel from the engine, you're going to heat that volume up very quick or you're going to get it to higher temperatures. If you're sending that fuel from the engine back to a larger tank, it's going to take a little longer to heat up. The overall volume won't heat up as much as it may on a very small tank. So it's important to understand your fuel system and problems that you might have. Uh, now we get on to the technology improvements. The high pressure common rail is becoming very common uh, within the industry. It's a more technologically improved system. Um, the fallacies come from the fuel. Uh, the fuel hasn't changed to account for the technology increases. So now everyone is racing to catch up and make sure their fuel meets the specification requirements of the system. Now a high pressure common rail fuel injection system is made up of a high pressure pump, a high pressure line, a rail system, the injectors for each combustion chamber, and the electronic control unit. Now the difference between this and existing systems is existing systems they would pressurize your injection every time the camshaft turned. So as your engine turned, it was pressurizing the injector, it would inject, and then it would have to do it for each one. So as that shaft turned, it would pressurize each, each injector and then inject into the combustion chamber. Nowadays, this, pre, uh, this high pressure pump takes care of the pressurization. So it's pressurizing the entire system. All the injectors are up to a very high pressure at any time. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, now you can inject up to four to five times per piston stroke, and that's because of the high pressure common rail fuel injection system. Previously it was tied to your cam, so it, you couldn't inject whenever you wanted to, it was only when the engine made a complete revolution. So now these systems, they're up to, at sometimes 40,000 PSI pressures. Uh, with these very high pressures compared to older systems, anything that's moving through there, the fuel, um, it's moving at much faster speeds and you have a much higher potential for abrasive wear. A uh, particle moving at 100 feet per second is more abrasive than a particle moving at 5 feet per second. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> now if you look at the injector itself, um, you can see it's made up of a valve and a valve seat. There's a valve inside the seat. There's a seat that sits inside the actual combustion chamber that sprays the fuel. That seat has holes in it where the fuel injects into the cylinder and there's a valve that sits in the middle of that seat. Now when fuel is ready to go into the cylinder or into the combustion chamber, the valve lifts up and the fuel goes around, uh, as you can see right here, and it injects out through those holes. So the goal is when the valve is closed or in the seat, no fuel goes into the combustion chamber. When the valve lifts out of the seat, fuel goes around the valve, through the holes, and injects into your combustion chamber. Um, these components, uh, they're very sensitive. The tolerances are very tight uh, on current engines. They are designed as efficient as they will ever be. Uh, any wear to these systems is not improving your, your combustion, it's not improving the efficiency of your engine, it is reducing it. They're designed optimally and as they start to wear, they work less well um, as for most components. So the issue nowadays is that to have these very high pressures, you need to have very good contact between the valve and the valve seat so that nothing is leaking between the valve and the valve seat into the chamber. That's not a good thing. Now what happens is, Injector tolerances have become so tight to maintain those pressures that they're becoming around the same size as the particulate we're trying to remove. Now, from an engineering perspective, when we look at two flat surfaces, say a table or a wall, we think they're flat. Um, when you look at them on a microscopic view, they're really jagged small surfaces. And that comes from the manufacturing process. Uh, you can't manufacture something that's more sensitive or more tight tolerance than the tools you're using. So we design tools, we manufacture a surface, it's only as flat as we can make it. So really if you were to look at the two surfaces of the valve and the valve seat, uh, on a micro scale, they're jagged. So when they come in contact, they're still stopping fuel from moving between it, but they're not completely flat surfaces. 
So now when you get particulate moving between these two surfaces as the valve lifts up, you've got very fast, very abrasive material chipping away at these two surfaces. So over time, you're going to start to wear these two surfaces down. And that's where the problem lies is when those two surfaces come together and your valve is in your valve seat, but fuel can still drip through, it's going to drip into your engine. That's, that's a big problem. Um, now what happens is these start to wear and they start to wear and they start to wear. And over time, you're going to get drops of fuel dripping onto your piston head. Uh, it's going to end up in your combustion chamber. It shouldn't be there. Not only are you wasting fuel, but now you're coating your piston head with carbon residue. Now that carbon residue provides a thermal barrier for the combustion in the engine so that now your engine, some areas are getting hotter than the other. Uh, what that can lead to is hot spots in your engine will produce NOx. Um, nitrogen is going to oxidize at higher temperature and pressure than uh, hydrocarbons. So you're going to get NOx build up. You're going to get thermal expansion of your parts in different ways. If some parts are, some areas of a certain part are hotter than the other, uh, one part is going to try to expand more and the other is going to expand less. You're going to get strain on those components. As they start to strain, they may scrape against your piston wall. Uh, there's a number of different things that can happen. It's bad overall. So the real importance here from the injector tip is making sure that particulate does not wear away the, uh, the seat or the valve and making sure that when it comes closed, it stays closed. Uh, regarding the tier four, what I was just discussing, these tolerances have gotten tighter and tighter with the pressure increases in these engines. Right now we're up to tier four for most industries. There are a few, depending on what their usage is um, for burn time, that are still on tier three. Um, backup generators can still be tier three, but they're all moving towards tier four. These were mandated by the EPA to reduce particulate matter, hydrocarbons, NOx, carbon monoxide, anything coming out your tailpipe. It's basically to clean up the environment. So the progress has been made on the technological side of the engine. It's the fuel that isn't keeping up. So diesel fuel and reliability, basically 80% of engine failures probably start in the tank. Now, it's the weakest link in the system. No one pays attention to it. They act like it's a commodity. No one's making sure the fuel is clean. They count on the engine to take care of everything. Uh, when really, if you were to put bad things in your blood, it does the same thing to your body. You wouldn't eat bad, fuel, bad food and expect good results for your body. I mean, it's, this, it's the same thing. Fuel is purchased and then it's commonly forgotten. It'll sit in the tank, it's gonna degrade, it'll oxidize, it'll repolymerize, you're gonna get buildup, you're gonna get stratification, so heavier components are gonna to sink to the bottom of your tank, you'll get water, you'll get, there's a whole number of issues basically when fuel is just forgotten about. So, <clears throat> newer engines are having trouble with the fuel quality, so we need to maintain the fuel as a critical reliability component and not just a commodity that you buy. You wanna ensure that you're putting the best fuel through your engine um, for a number of different reasons. And it's the lifeblood of your engine, really. So the effects of contamination, um, like I mentioned, as your injectors start to fail and they start to wear, um, you're gonna get in inefficiency, you're gonna burn less fuel, you're gonna get black smoke, which is really unburnt fuel. So if your engine isn't combusting it during the piston stroke, it's going to go out your headers, out your exhaust, uh, leading to something like that. Now, <clears throat> We would consider this a partial functional failure. If you're letting your injectors wear away and they're not like they were originally designed to do, they're not gonna run optimally and you're gonna get, um, we call it a partial functional failure. Now, catastrophic full functional failure is when at some point your injector is spraying into the engine and you can't oxidize that fuel enough to continue the piston stroke. So if you're spraying globs in your engine instead of a uh, nice fine atomized mist and it's not vaporizing, your engine isn't getting enough power out of that fuel to make the next revolution. And that's where you get full functional failure. So back to the injector and the valve seat. Uh, this is an upside down um, image of a valve seat and you can see the holes. There's actually two here. You can see the holes where your fuel actually sprays into the combustion chamber. Uh, the one on the left is relatively new while the one on the right, you can see a lot of corrosion. You've got carbon buildup around these holes. So if the carbon is getting heated and it's sticking to this, injector uh, valve seat and it's building up around these holes, it's going to change the way the fuel sprays into the engine. These are designed so that when the fuel sprays into the engine, it's in a very atomized mist. It's directly all around the engine so that when it combusts, you're getting combustion in every different point of the combustion chamber. What happens is as you build up the carbon on these holes, it's spraying, it may jet spray into a certain area. So now you're spraying instead of very small atomized um, droplets, you're getting very large droplets. Now these large droplets, if you think about fuel oxidizing it from the outside and combusting, 
Maybe it can't oxidize that entire fuel droplet by the time it leaves the piston stroke and it goes into your engine or into your exhaust. So what happens is these fuel droplets get larger and larger. The more wear you get on your injectors, the more buildup, the more they fail. And at some point, the droplets are so large that you can't combust them and you're not pulling the energy out of the fuel. So that's a big issue. Uh, the one we talked about before, you can see two different wear patterns on these two injector valves. Uh, as these, as these uh, open and close relatively fast, you're going to get wear and build up over time, which can lead to drip into your combustion chamber. Now, the important thing to know about these is if you take a, take a second and think about how many times these injector valves operate. When you think about 3,000 RPMs, if you're running your engine, or even 1,800 RPMs, uh, that's 1,800 revolutions to your engine per minute. So that means each piston stroke is going 1,800 times in that, mist, uh, in that minute. Now your injector, if you're injecting four to five times per piston stroke, you're talking about almost 10,000 injection events in a minute. <laughs> so the life of these injectors are billions and sometimes billions of injection events. So you can see how wear can start to build up. Even if very small particulate is starting to wear those surfaces and it's slow, relatively slow, it's still going to do a number on your injector valves and seats. So we've basically painted the picture of a failure chain reaction. How we go from having a clean working engine to uh, a degraded engine, a less inefficient or less efficient engine, and one that will ultimately fail. Uh, so you're going to get valve erosion. Obviously, we discussed valve erosion and how the particulate will will facilitate that. You're going to get leakage through those mating surfaces. You're going to get hot spots in your engine because now you're getting carbon buildup within your engine. You're going to get reduced fuel pressure at your nozzle as those holes start to wear away. Um, it's going to change how you're spraying into the engine. You're going to get reduced volume of fuel delivered, or that's what the engine sees. So your ECU or your engine is going to try to compensate by putting more fuel into your engine. So you're, now you're wasting more fuel than you originally were uh, using. You're going to get reduced fuel atomization. It's going to spray in different directions. It's not going to be a fine atomized mist. You might get a jet towards your sidewall. Uh, at that point, if you're getting fuel on your sidewall, that's an easy way to get fuel into your oil. If your piston's moving up and down and pulling carbon residue off your sidewalls, well, now it ends up in your oil, and you're also reducing the quality of your oil. Uh, you'll get soot generation, like I mentioned, within the cylinder. Your increase in emissions you're going to see through uh, black smoke or uh, failing your uh, failing your test, <laughs> you're going to get loss of power in the engine. You're going to get a what we call the partial functional failure point, where you're seeing black smoke. You can feel there's a difference in your engine. You've really degraded it to a certain point now. Uh, and then the leakage rate is just going to continue to increase as wear increases. Your fuel is going to your fuel consumption is going to increase. Obviously, as it continues to wear, you're going to hear the visible and audible signs. And then we reach the full functional failure point, uh, where you can't pull any energy out of your fuel or not enough to make the engine uh, revolve. Okay, so after the questions, that brings us to fuel cleanliness standards, basically how to protect the integrity of our fuel, and now we're looking at mitigating some of the issues we looked at uh, within the first half of this presentation. That brings us to specifications for fuel. Who is making your specifications, and what does it mean to keep your fuel clean? Uh, it starts off with looking at your fuel from a couple of different perspectives. ISO codes, international standards. Um, a lot of countries use these standards uh, for a number of different things, not just fuel, but what are ISO codes? And 4406 is the one that pertains to fuel. And why are they important to our fuel? And then we'll look at what tier four quality is. We mentioned the uh, improvement in technology, but uh, what does the fuel need to meet in order to be, I guess, certified for these types of engines? Uh, whether it's an engine OEM or whether it's an injector OEM, and how clean does your fuel really need to be? Uh, we'll look at OEM standards and then what promotes optimum runtime and where they get those numbers from. And then we'll look at warranty concerns because running bad fuel through your engine might void your warranty. That's one of the first things they'll check if you have a failed engine and you're looking for a warranty claim. So basically we want to keep fuel to spec and how do we do that? Uh, for ISO codes, ISO cleanliness codes, 4406 is the reference you want to make. Now what ISO codes are is they're a way to quantify how much particulate you have in your fuel. Uh, they use three numbers, basically. You'll see uh, the common one you'll hear is 18, 16, 13. The first number, or the leftmost number, refers to the number of particles in a milliliter sample that are four microns in size or greater. Uh, the second number refers to the number of six micron particles or greater. 
in a milliliter sample. And the final one, or the rightmost, is the number of particles in a milliliter that are 14 microns and greater. Uh, each one of these are inclusive, so if you look at the number of particles that are 4 microns and greater, it will obviously include ones that are 6 microns and greater along with 14. So the number will always be larger uh, on the left number or the first number and get smaller. If it isn't, you've got a problem and you probably want to see what, uh, what happened. Now these numbers are only specifying a range of particulate. So if we look at, you'll need a chart basically to reference. It's not always needed, but um, if you really want to know the number of particles you actually have in the fuel and you're not happy with the range number, you can pull an ISO 4406 chart. You can look at the range number, which would be an 18, and that is basically specifying that you have between 1300 and 2500 particles in that sample that are four microns and greater. Uh, ISO codes are very good at telling you whether you have a dirty or clean sample. What they don't do is tell you what the problem is. So they'll tell you whether it's clean or not, but you don't understand if it is dirty, why your fuel is dirty, what the problem really is, and how to solve it. Um, you can filter it, but you maybe have a problem that just continues to propagate and you don't know why that's happening. <clears throat> uh, so basically there's ways to verify fuel quality depending on who is asking and who is checking. Uh, first off, we're gonna move from the left to the right here. These are the most basic ones, visual samples. Uh, depending on what your tank configuration looks like, take a look at your fuel, look in, see if it looks dirty, pull a little top sample, dip a little, uh, a little tube in there and see what you can find. Uh, next would be we consider fuel sampling. This is where you're taking samples of your fuel from certain areas of the tank that we know are prone to have problems. Normally the bottom, if your tank is on an incline, even a slight incline, you might have one end that's more dirty than the other. So you want to obviously take the sample from the dirty end because as your fuel starts to mix up, you can pull all that contamination right into your fuel system. Um, so we're looking for microbes, for water, um, for particulate, anything that's going to end up on the bottom of your tank. That's normally what all the bad stuff really is. You also don't want to look at your return line back to your tank. Uh, if you're putting fuel back into your tank quite often and you have a downspout where fuel enters the tank, it's going to blow or spread any particulate that would end up underneath that to other corners of the tank. So try to pick up from either a suction area or somewhere uh, on a corner. The next best thing in understanding your fuel quality would be a particle counter. Uh, what a particle counter does is it uses a laser. You run fuel continuously over the laser-based screen and it's going to count the number of particles of certain sizes in your fuel. This is a good way to get a quick ISO count if you're in the field and you don't want to send it off for a lab test. It's a much cheaper way to understand how clean the fuel is if you're not mandated uh, to buy a fuel test. And then finally would be lab testing like I mentioned. Um, lab testing for a fuel is more on the chemical basis. You're going to get a cetane readout. You're going to see the distillates and where they burn off. You're going to get an understanding of the overall chemistry of the fuel. Um, it will typically include an ISO count. Uh, most labs will provide you with the cleanliness of your fuel and they'll make a recommendation at this point you should clean your fuel, remove the water. Um, it's, it's normal. But lab testing, you're going to see different types of tests and different prices depending on what tests you're having done. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, high frequency reciprocating rig because they have to take a physical sample and put it in a real rig and move that rig for a certain amount of time is going to be a much more expensive test than some of the quick chemical tests they can do. So you will see um, structured or tiered lab tests uh, and price obviously is a factor in that. So you always want to perform periodic inspections on your tank. Uh, it's recommended every three months, but uh, we would always recommend putting a type of system that will maintain the fuel continuously because if your fuel sample fails at three months, where was it at two months? Uh, the same thing, where was it at one month? You could have failed far before you actually found out you had the problem. So it's really good to know how your fuel is and then you have a planned maintenance schedule that uh, is going to keep the fuel up to spec. Fuel sampling, uh, like I mentioned before, getting to some of these areas in the bottom of the tank, there are certain tools that are provided or that are available, uh, fuel bombs or bacon bombs that you can get a tank sample from the bottom and make sure you're not mixing or agitating the fuel because it's not a real reflection of what's happening in the bottom of your tank. Uh, hand pumps where you can put a small tube into a corner of a tank to find out a problem area and retrieve some of that sample. Those are good tools. Water finding paste. There's a number of these in the market. Um, you put it on a stick, you stick it to the bottom of the tank, and it's going to turn color if it finds water. So you can get a measured approximation of how much water is actually in your tank. Uh, a quick note on water finding paste. Some of these are rendered inert if you're using a biocide in your fuel. It actually will not pick up that you have water. Um, there's aqueous phase biocides, then there's um, fuel-based uh, biocides. It's whether they stay in solution within the fuel or the water. 
but the aqueous phase biocides will usually render these tests inert. So you may look like you have no water at all, but really you could have a lot of water. And then there's always visual inspection. You, so not only do you wanna check the fuel, but you wanna, if you really wanna find out what the problem is and how to prevent it, you wanna check the fittings of your tank, all the lines, your caps, you wanna make sure that there is no problem. Um, you're not getting air that's moist all the time. You can get a breather for your system. You can make sure all your seals are tight. Nothing is corroded or degraded. Um, those are very important. So basically minutes of time from a planned maintenance perspective can save thousands of dollars and ensure that your assets uh, stay maintained. And it all starts with the fuel. So cleaning fuel tanks, or we like to refer to as maintenance, um, is typically performed on a closed loop dialysis type system. Basically you're extracting fuel from one end of the tank, for the most part your lowest point, pulling it through a maintenance system, removing any particulate, water, conditioning the fuel, returning it to the other end of the tank. So you're getting a nice flow in the tank. You're basically not allowing uh, the water to build up. You're gonna remove it before you even have a chance. And that's gonna prevent a lot of the problems that we already talked about. Uh, there's also fuel additives. If you've got a base tank or a belly tank, structural tanks or an engine sitting on top of it, uh, these tanks will typically have walls that need to be spanned the inside uh, with holes in them. So the fuel can move if it needs to, but what you get is you get points where the fuel can't move uh, it gets stuck and then it's going to build up. You're going to get sludge. It's very hard to move. So fuel additives is always something that should be recommended um, to help break down some of the sludge, some of the stuff that may build up where an automated system can't, uh, can't help you completely. Uh, most of these systems come with fuel related alarms, um, high vacuum, high pressure. We are looking at filters and when they clog, you want some indication that your filters clogged. So you're not just bypassing and performing no, uh, no filtration with the system. High water level, you're gonna to wanna to know when to change out the water, make sure that the, the system is on a planned maintenance schedule as well too. Um, a leak within the system or no flow. So a number of things you'll see within the industry that are pretty common on these systems. Uh, that brings us to filters. You can have the best design system in the world, but if they put bad filters on it, you're really not gonna get much out of it. Filter is really um, where you need to be. Um, the things that you look at with filters are typically the efficiency and the beta ratio. These are both synonymous. They mean the same things, but they're calculated in different ways. They basically have um, two numbers or a percentage and a number, and the higher they are, the better your filter. Uh, there is single pass and then there's multi-pass efficiencies. It really depends on your application and what you need to do. Now everyone will often say that they have a filter on their engine, but one thing about the filters on your engine is they are lab tested for the efficiency they get, so they may have a 99.9% .9 efficiency, uh, but that is in a lab at a certain flow rate, at a certain temperature, um, isolated from other components. So there are factors that come into play when it's on your engine, such as heat, that filter is gonna heat up, your fuel may be warm. You get vibration from the engines, unless they have vibration dampeners. Now vibration will reduce the efficiency of a filter uh, a decent amount. You're basically shaking the particulate off of that filter, and your smaller particulates are gonna move through. Uh, flow surge, you're changing the RPMs of your engine. As you run, you're not staying at a consistent speed or RPM, it's changing. And then there may exi be existing contamination in the fuel system that's starting to break off and uh, the, f the fuel system itself could be wearing down. So uh, a common question with fuel filters is how long is my fuel filter life? Uh, a lot of places or companies will do a planned maintenance strategy so they, they chop out the amount of time that they need before changing filters and they stick to it regardless of how, uh, how that filter has performed, how much that filter has gathered in terms of particulate and they set to it. You could be wasting filters, you could be spending a lot of money that you don't need to. Um, so from a maintenance perspective with an automated system, you can have that system run, it's gonna shut down when the filters are clogged and then you eliminate the need to change out your engine filters as often. You can change your, man, uh, your planned maintenance hours may extend them by a ways. Now, when we talk about efficiency, um, there's a couple of terms within the industry you're gonna hear, nominal and absolute. Uh, absolute filters are 98.7% efficient or higher. Uh, it's, it's a common term. They may use absolute in place of an efficiency rating. If they say absolute, you know that's a pretty good filter. You know you're gonna be removing the majority of your particulate. Uh, nominal, these filters are typically 50, to 75% efficient. Uh, they're not putting the number out there for that reason. They aren't designed to be super absolute or they aren't designed to remove all particulate in a single pass or be very high efficiency. 
Now, <clears throat> Absolute are obviously gonna co uh, cost more. This is a, a more stringent manufacturing process. It takes a lot more to manufacture these, so the price difference is, is great. Uh, you can see here, though, the difference between a nominal or an Absolute when we talk about efficiency is if the average pore size here is three microns and the average pore size here is three microns, you can see how well this filter will do to remove particulate compared to this one. There's gonna be a difference in the manufacturing process so that some make it through, you do catch some large particulate, but it's not as um, well manufactured as this one. Now, don't get me wrong, these aren't bad. Uh, they can help you in an economical sense. If you wanna filter a really bad tank and you've got a tank that needs to be remediated instead of maintained, uh, you'll probably wanna use nominal filters so you're not burning through a lot of absolute filters. You'll use these cheaper ones to remove a lot of the big sludge and the big waste uh, because they are cheap. It's, it's an easy solution. You'll move on at the end to the absolute when you want to meet a certain ISO count or you want to know you meet a certain uh, cleanliness within your fuel. So there are places for both of these filters. Two other terms you're going to hear within the industry are hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophobic repels water or doesn't let water through. A lot of filters will block water from passing. This tends to be in a uh, free water though. Uh, it's not going to block molecular or emulsified water. Hydrophilic is going to adsorb water into its surface. Uh, these are typically disposable. Once it's adsorbed into the media, you can't remove it. You need to throw the media away, uh, but it will remove some emulsified and free water. So <clears throat> another method of removing um, water and particulate for that would be centrifugal. Uh, we already we already discussed how diesel fuel is less dense or lighter than water. Um, so when you spin them, like those rides at the fair, the water is going to want to move towards the outside while the fuel stays on the inside. Um, as you're pushing them towards the outside, droplets of water are going to coalesce together and become larger droplets until they're back into free water. Um, so centrifugally, you can remove a lot of water and particulate. Coalescing is the most expensive way to remove water. It's going to remove the most. It's going to remove emulsified water uh, potentially some dissolved water, uh, but it becomes very expensive very quick. Now, a coalescing filter, uh, the goal of a coalescing filter is for very small water droplets to adhere to the filter media. So they adhere to the media and they adhere uh, semi-close to each other. The media fills up with these water droplets and at some point the, uh, the attraction between the water molecules is greater than the attraction between the media and the water and they adhere together or coalesce into a larger droplet. Now that droplet may stick to the media for a little bit longer as a larger droplet, but at some point when it gets large enough, it drops off and it becomes free water. Uh, I basically use the analogy, it's like driving down the road in a rainy, uh, rainy day and you've got droplets of water and all of a sudden they're moving close together and they seem to coalesce together. Uh, water has an attraction to itself, high surface tension. So what happens is you adhere the water to this media, it drops off and then you block the water from continuing the flow. So you're you're basically um, making large water droplets and turning it into a free water. The thing about coalescing media is it's typically very expensive. It's based on surface area. So if you want to remove a lot, of model, a lot of water in a large flow rate, you need a lot of surface area or very large filters. So these, these can get very large, very quick. They're not always as, um, they're not as prominent in the mobile side because they get so big so fast and they're very expensive to switch out the media. Uh, on a coalescing filter, they can be used for like a number of years if they're taken care of. What happens is since the water needs to adhere to this surface, if you're letting particulate onto that surface and you're blocking that surface, now the water can't adhere and you've ruined that filter. So you will need to replace it. So with a coalescing filter, there's always a recommendation you put a very high efficiency particulate filter of a lower rated micron in front of it. So you're removing any of the stuff that may damage the coalescing filter. Uh, just a note on biodiesel, we've mentioned it a couple times in this presentation. Uh, within the U.S. at least, a lot of places are moving to at least a B5, even a B10. So they're blending biodiesel in with your ULSD. Um, biodiesel has a positive energy balance, cheap sourcing depending on where they get it, um, greenhouse gas reduction from the way it's extracted. Uh, it's biodegradable in some sense, but biodiesel will also gel in, um, quicker than standard diesel. Now. Biodiesel, they're breaking down a triglyceride, uh, they go through transesterification, and what happens is you end up with a hydrocarbon molecule that has an oxygen bonded onto the end of it. Now, the oxygen makes that molecule polar, so biodiesel tends to stick to itself, almost like water does, more than regular diesel. 
So what happens is in cold weather, like we mentioned, those particles that couldn't slide past each other, uh, biodiesel has an even larger problem with that. They stick together even more. So during cold weather, you get faster gelling at a lower or a higher temperature. And that's gonna lead to clogging, obviously. Um, plus, poor quality, it's not as highly regulated as um, ULSD stuff that comes out of the refinery. That's also because it comes from a number of different sources. You've got rapeseed, you've got palm oil, um, reused oils. So there's a number of reasons why they can't control the quality as well as they do with regular diesel. Uh, and then because it has an oxygen already on the end of that molecule, it's already been partially combusted um, when you look at it relative to a diesel molecule. So if you've got a, a molecule that already has an oxygen on it, well, you already combusted or oxidized part of it. You're not going to be able to extract the energy because it's already oxidized. Uh, and then it's typically more expensive. Uh, that will really depend on your geographic location and where you are and the, the type of fuel you're getting. Um, to solve a lot of the issues we talked about with fuel, um, with the sitting and storage of fuel, you want to maintain the optimal fuel through a number of different ways, um, along with the planned maintenance strategy, filtration, separation, conditioning, and additives. Um, it's a, a four-stage process that we like to use in unison. It's the only way to ensure that your fuel is going to be always optimal and always clean. So they work hand in hand to present a full solution. Okay, so this is the configuration you'd normally see on a backup fuel storage system. This is uh, commonly where you see most of the problems because the fuel is stored for a long period of time and it sits um, and it has a lot of problems. So this is a kidney loop type system where you're pulling fuel from the lowest point in the tank, the worst fuel. You're performing conditioning, water separating, um, a number of different items, and then you're returning that clean fuel back to the tank and you're making a flow, a continuous flow. So that way you don't allow the water or sludge to build up. Um, you're going to pull fuel, normally systems will have a day tank and then your engine will take that fuel from the day tank. Now what happens is as the engine takes in a certain amount of clean fuel, the unused hot fuel uh, will either go back to the stored tank or it will go back to the day tank. So when we look at thermal stability, you get this fuel that was used as a lubricity agent and as a cooling agent and now you're dumping it back into a room temperature tank. So you're going to heat that tank up over the day. Um, but this is kind of what you'd see, and this is really where you want to take care of your problem, at the source. You don't want to get the fuel to here and then try to clean it on the way because you can't, that's not a, uh, it's not a very redundant solution. Um, you could experience problems along the way. So for more information or if you have any questions, please contact us at AXI International. Uh, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter, or you can visit our website at www.axi-international.com.